you can either take the red pill, you'll wake up, everything was a dream, or you can take the black pill, you can get torched. Well, I suppose getting torched won't hurt that much. I don't feel anything. Wait for it. Oh, wait. I just got a new client. Get torched! Get, get, get torched! Uh, get torched! Hey guys, Brandon Burns here from Torch Productions. Behind the camera is Ben Thompson, my partner in crime. You won't see him, but it's important to note because we've been having the most amazing chat off camera and we decided, well, we should press record like sooner rather than later because all the good stuff might be lost. Um, now, I want to introduce you to my guest. I would best describe him as someone who's really got a voice now in not just the fintech, but startup space in Australia uh, and scale up space, but he's also had a really varied career similar to myself um, and he's done some amazing stuff pre where he is now, which I really want to get him to share today as, all, as well. And he's going to talk to us about his new business, his new venture, and where they're up to and what they're trying to do. So without further ado, Kane Jackson, how are you? Good, thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Mate, and you've rocked up in the traditional startup <laughs> shirt. Yeah, i got to rock it. Apparently, you have to. <laughs> Mate, isn't it amazing how a little bit of merch can go a long, long way? Absolutely. I mean, I've only got one shirt, so I just keep wearing it. Oh, really? Occasionally, I wash it. <laughs> Does it shrink or do your biceps grow? Uh, no, I, I used to fit into it. It's not really muscle, let's be honest. Okay, <laughs> nice. Well, it looks good on you, man. <laughs> hey, speaking of which, um, is there something in when you choose brand and brand colors, depending upon um, the type of person you're trying to sell to? Or like, how did you land on, I guess, what would you call that purple? Or... It's, a, it's a pink. Pink, pink's friendly, you know. I think everyone had a doubt at some point who started wearing a pink shirt a couple of years ago. I was like, no, pink's cool now. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I like it. Yeah, look, um, look, it's more, more reflective of the fact that we're, uh, I guess, a, a non-financial services approach to financial services. We're all outsiders. We're from a health background. Pink's a very friendly color. Yeah. So yeah, it speaks to a, a broader audience. So tell me, um, before I ask you about what you did in a former life, I think it's really cool. Share with me who your co-founders are how you guys got together and what they do in their background. Yeah, sure. So, um, Caitlin Robinson and Elliot Marjo. Um, I met Caitlin a while ago. We went to primary school together. So I've known oh, really? her for 29 ish years. Mate, that's fantastic. Trust is there. Trust is there, which is massive in startups. Um, yep. Ali, I met on the journey. Um, uh, they ran another, um, a, a startup that, uh, they've sort of stepped away from recently. And um, shared values, shared mission. We just, we sort of a little bit sick of this world that sort of helps push certain people forward and, and not others. So yeah. we, yeah, we joined forces and here we are. Wow, that's cool. Um, I think it's so important to have at least a running partner or a running mate. You know, Ben and I, we bounce off each other so well, especially starting a business. How have you found handling and what a benefit has it been having the dynamic of not just one running mate, but a third voice as well? Yeah, I think, the biggest advantage from my perspective is we're doing something that is really outside the box uh, and that can be uh, a little bit isolating. It can be certainly not, not just lonely, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty Yeah, because we're doing something that, you know, by definition changes how an entire industry operates, you know, how its business model works. Uh, that means there's not a lot of people that we can put our hand up in the industry and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or, yep. you know, my sanity checking group is fairly limited because uh, either people have uh, interests with companies that wouldn't be overly successful if we succeed, uh, or they don't have the understanding um, to say, well, how does it work in the context of this, 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 I guess, change you're proposing? So having people who have shared values and uh, interests and a similar view of the world, but also who challenge me, enables me to sort of say, hey, what do you think of this? And get an honest sort of, you know, honest feedback on it. Love it. Now, if I threw a couple of statements at you that maybe we'd heard from our parents or people when we were kids, I want you to give me your, your comment, the first thing that comes to mind. Money makes the world go round. Yeah, it does. Um, it's who it makes the world go round for that's the issue. Uh, we're seeing a lot of inequality at the moment, and that inequality serves let's call it uh, a world where our parents might feel more comfortable than we do today. Um, it's really white male heavy. Um, and, you know, if you have a look at the industry, we've got an industry that's left over from, you know, time in our history that was sort of the same 200 years ago, and we're not the same society. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, money does make the world go round. We're trying to change who it makes the world go round for. You've got to spend money to make money. 
Ah, oh, that's an interesting one. I hate that. Uh, you've got to spend money to make money. It, I don't, I don't, I don't relate to that statement whatsoever. It, mm -hmm. it sounds, um, you know, I, I think it speaks to quality. You know, you get what you pay for. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, in today's um, climate, if you, if you, you can make money by having better values or, you know, having a, a mission that's stronger than others. So yeah, maybe you don't have to spend money to make money. You've got to fail fast. Yes, you do. You've got to fail fast and you've got to get up. Uh, that's hard. Failing is, yeah, I don't know. Failing is, we've got this weird fear of failure. Um, is that an Australian thing? Um, I don't know. We've got a weird fear of being successful if it's not us in Australia too. So, you know, look, Australia is a really unique space. Fear about failure. Um, I think, I don't know, failure is different. Failure is just challenge, mm -hmm. you know, and I think pushing through, you learn from failure, you learn from challenge. So. Yep. One thing I've noticed about you, Kane, and I reckon it's a real strength, is that you're not um, shy in sharing your journey with a larger audience, so you know, LinkedIn in particular, but it's been fascinating to see, and there's a lot of other people that do this now, and you know, not that long ago, it would have been seen as a real fearful thing for people and a sign of um, weakness to share how they're actually going on the journey, but tell me how it's actually benefited you. Um, look, I, it took me a long time, you know, I talk about spending my twenties outgrowing, you know, unlearning my teens and, you know, I grew up in a world that, um, was very much, um, male dominated. I went to a, a private school, an all male pri private school. And I was, you know, I was in the closet and it wasn't a great experience for me. And, yeah. you know, that experience taught me to keep, you know, my personal to myself and sort of, yeah. you know, not talk about who I am and, and what I am. Um, you know, my twenties was my twenties was a process of learning that that's not really how I should go through life, and you know, finding comfort on that journey and finding my 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 community, my crowd. Um, you know, learning who values what and how to find the right people. Um, and then from there, it's just a case of well, you know, truth's really important to me, not just in um, you know who I am and what I'm doing, but the world. You know, truth is so important, and that's one of the things where pursuing so much. So if I'm going to put my hand up and say, hey, we're advocates of truth, you know, we, no matter how, how hard it is, those conversations we have to have about truth can be really difficult. And I've got to be pretty open and honest about literally everything. So yeah, no, there are no, there are no secrets for me. No, no closets anymore, let's say. I'm going to ask Kane in a minute what Maslow actually is and does. But before I ask you that, um, I think it's so cool when you see an entrepreneur, it can be a a wanky word. It's a horrible know, word. Uh, a founder or a business, you know, business owner, or someone it. having a go. Um, I think it's really cool when you see how they've done something completely different prior, or they've got a really curious mindset that's led them to ending up where they are. And it's almost like they didn't pick an industry or a, a sector, rather they just followed wanting to uh, solve a problem or, or a passion. So you were a paramedic. I trained as a paramedic um, and I... I started, I never knew what I wanted to do. I started my first business when I was 16. And I've always found business. What really, was that? I was a cleaning company. I cleaned up other people's fill, which is what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you say fill, uh, like the remnants of like a, a murder scene and a dead body. Uh, look, it was mainly or... just how filthy people are in their offices. It's okay. so funny. I always say I learned, one thing I learned from running a cleaning business more than anything else was that people are filthy, but expect others to be clean. Okay. And it's really interesting. So you go to an office space and it's like, oh, everyone clean your dishes and whatever. You go back to their desk and it's just a filth. <laughs> so what's the filthiest thing you, you had to clean up that maybe uh, you almost didn't? There was, a, there was a guy who used to clip his toenails at his desk no. and there would just be like, it was like almost like a pile of empty peanut shells. It was that bad. Oh. It was gross. Wow. Yeah. That's what I mean. It was feral. Yeah. It was feral. So there's some lines you just won't cross. Yeah. No. <laughs> For being a paramedic. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, tell me about the good part of the job and then tell me about the part that made you go, I'm going to do something about this. Yeah, look, part of training to be a paramedic requires you do a certain number of hours on road. It's one of the best things about the way you go through uni, do your degree, and at the same time, you're doing on-road placement. And during those, um, quite, a, quite a large number of hours, um, and you do placement all around Victoria. You do uh, metro, rural. A lot of rural stuff because there's obviously shortfalls in in sort of um the medical system or the health system in, in rural areas so you see a really good cross-section of society and like i'd done a fair bit of community-based work um, at the end of my school life um but i'd never really gone far outside of melbourne and experience you know seen how people experience the world and you know my experience or view of the world 
as a you know uh, middle class white dude in Melbourne going to a private school is not how the world you know is. And so that was amazing. And we saw I saw a lot of people who well let's say below the fifty percent line. You know the people that just sort of ha halfway or or less in society in terms of wealth, opportunity, all these sorts of things. Um, and predominantly that's who paramedics go to. Yeah, sure, everyone has a heart attack every now and then and you go to them. But, you know, if you look at who the emergency healthcare system serves most, it's people who don't get a really good go in society. It's people with drug addiction, people who are the product of uh, systems and industries that punish people for having less, less, less money, which is one of them being the finance industry. And there were so many recurrent themes in what I saw on road and it all came down to the people not being given a fair go by society. And if I drilled into what that was, it was all about money. It was all about, I don't have enough money. I'm not served by the money industry. I don't understand money. I don't know how to get out of this hole. And you've got this industry that doesn't want people to get out of this hole. And so, you know, I've got this massive sense of, in, you know, I hate injustice. It, it drives me. It's the one thing that drives me. Um, if I look at something and it's not fair, it just, it has to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And so it was all about this finance industry was the worst of all of them, of all the industries. It was this industry that... Quite faceless as well, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, all of these people I would go to would have payday loans and they couldn't, you know, and then their kids wouldn't have clothes because it's just, it's this, it's a mess. I can go into it for hours, mm -hmm. but it was this horrible recurrent theme. And, you know, Caitlin, who has been a paramedic for 12-ish years, I think, um, she runs uh, operations for Ambulance Victoria now. So right now she's at the dispatch center handling mm -hmm. all of Ambulance Victoria's resources and dispatching them. And, you know, we agree that 50% of patients that are attended by a paramedic wouldn't need that paramedic if they were part of a fairer socio-economic or socio-cultural system. And that absolutely starts with the finance industry and giving people basic human rights. You know, we have this understanding here in Australia that everyone should be able to walk into a hospital and get treated. Well, financial well-being is the, is the foundation of all well-being in today's economy or society. And yet we don't have that same understanding that the financial industry should give people basic human rights. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, man. So paint a picture for me, but visually. So just walk me through, I know you've shared this on another show before, but for people who may not have heard, can you walk me through the simulate that example for me where you can pinpoint how you knew when you attended to someone who was in a scenario that it was rooted in this problem with finance because a lot of people would say or would think finance doesn't have any form of bad or good health thing attributed to it it just feels separate but show me how it's connected yeah absolutely so we talk about disposable income right mm -hmm. and one of the things that australia does really well is you, if you have an emergency health situation, you can go and get treated and that's fine. But if you've got a cough or a sore ankle or whatever it might be, generally speaking, it's really hard to get in to see a doctor for free, right? So if you don't have the disposable income to pay for the car that you have to drive to the doctor or get an, a taxi or an Uber, if you don't have the disposable income to pay the gap between the doctor to pay for the, the medication for whatever that, that thing is, all of a sudden, you have this little niggle, this minor health concern that could have been solved that, ev that evolves and develops into something else because you don't have the money to, um, to address these things. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have the money in almost all of the cases. And, you know, some of the, um, the consumer advocate groups talk a lot about this. The, the correlation between people who don't get m minor health issues sort, seen, up, seen to uh, and the people who are eternally or consistently taking out payday loans or who have credit cards who are, who are bankrupt at some point and have been uh, you know, ostracized from involvement in this finance industry. They're the ones that are charged the most to access financial products because they're the highest risk. And that's fair enough in the, in the current sort of structure of the industry. But you've got one healthcare system and you've got governments trying to advance policies that help people sort of get out of these situations that they're in and you've got this industry that won't let them mm -hmm. and there's an absolute um, crossover in, in those things almost every time and if we don't change the predatory element of that mm -hmm. how can we expect any of the policies that we pass to help people who are on the tail end of our, our society and our economy mm -hmm. move forward and so when you speak about it from the other angle of uh, it would save money and resources if we improve that scenario 
that's still not enough to drive people. So not at all. I mean, preventative healthcare policy is uh, a, a, a focus of mine. And, you know, I've, I've had many conversations with people who talk about it and it has to look at money. It just has to look at money. Yep. And it might be that, you know, let's say if I, let's play devil's advocate and say, well, look, I, let's say I can't change the entire finance industry. I, I think I can, but if I can't, then there should be a portion of the finance industry that has to serve the, the, the people in our society that need help the most, just as our healthcare system does that. If you're loaded, and of course you are, you know, you're oh, an yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, if you, but if you're loaded, you can pay for private health insurance. You can go and have a private room at a hospital and all these sorts of things. Well, why, why should the finance industry be any different? If you've got lots of money, go pay for cool stuff. But if you don't, if you can't afford it, we have a view that you should be able to walk into an emergency room and not um, be preyed on. Mm -hmm. Why do we not have that same view when it comes to you getting from paycheck to paycheck. Okay, that's great. So now we've established kind of this leading up to this this why, right? We don't want people to get the wrong idea that Maslow's are improving the healthcare system. However, it probably will as a result. So hit me now with what it is and you know what it's going to do. Yeah, really simply at the moment. So Maslow is a platform where you as a, as a customer can buy all of your financial products that you need on your journey through life, whether it's a a home loan, a bank account, um, insurance, lending, lending, investing, all those sorts of things. And they'll change over time as we're seeing. Um, at the moment, when you buy those products, the current industry uh, benefits from when you make a decision, right? They get paid when you buy the product. So they're incentivized. And a trail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Trailing commissions are a huge issue. Um, but they get, they're incentivized to push you over the line to make the decision. And they all their marketing does that. And now the industry makes money in that way, but that might not be the best product for you. And so they hide the details of the product, which no normal person could compare. Mm -hmm. Even some very smart people in the industry I know still don't read the, the product disclosure statement. The, the PDF. The PDF. Is that the same as when you click the terms and conditions to join Facebook? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Um, no one reads it. They're probably, they're probably even worse than the finance industry terms and conditions, <laughs> to be fair. No, but you know, I think, um, at the moment, the industry is really incentivized to make money off your decisions, right? And that's a massive problem because you don't understand the product. No one does. But, um, you, but you need to make a decision because you need finance. Absolutely. You need a home loan. You need, you need insurance. Car loan. You, you need yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we talk about these products not being luxuries. It shouldn't be a luxury to have insurance on your cards, you know, it's your second most valuable asset usually. And but you can't compare, there's all these products, you can't compare them. All of the companies are incentivized to sell the product to you using flashy marketing or 30 second ads, hide all of the details in an 80 page document. But ultimately their interests are to sell you the product. Well, the only way it feels like you can compare them is based upon rates or price. Well, that's usually how most but, people choose a yeah, financial product. And, the, and once again, the consumer's, you know, driven, but also a little distracted by best price, best rate. But it's like, what, what if the policy they take out doesn't have coverage for the one thing they likely going to need? The question most people don't ask is why is that product cheaper than the other product, right? Yeah. And so it's because there's less benefit, you know? And I mean, the finance industry is the only industry in the world that um, gives its customers or sells its customers the same thing its shareholders want. Every, every financial product is money and shareholders want money in return. So you've got this conflict. You've only got so much money and you're So the company. only differentiator is marketing or? Well, the only differentiator is what, what you get in terms of the product quality. What does the product actually give you? Mm -hmm. But they don't tell you and you don't know because it's in an 80 page document that no one reads. So they start carving things out to make it cheaper because most people make the decision based on the price. So they look at the price on the page, whether it's on a comparison site or otherwise, you go, oh, look, it's, that's $1,000 to insure my car. That's 821, I'll go 821. Why is it 821? They're yep. probably making the same amount of profit. It yep. just so happens they cover less. So you hit a, hit a tree and you find out for whatever reason you're not covered and maybe someone else driving your car and they don't cover certain people. And yes, they sort of tell you some parts of it, but they're incentivized to get you to make the decision. And we don't have a lot of time when we make decisions. So, so do you think if people knew that, they would choose the higher policy? I, I don't know. And I mean, I think, I think people are different. It's every, you know, every experience is, is, is different. Yeah. The biggest issue we have is we've got this industry of companies that are, have the wrong incentive, right? So they make money to sell the product. Well, what if we change that? And they just were, were more honest and... Well, uh, so the example we use is Costco, right? So the difference between, let's say, um, Woolworths and Costco is when you walk into Woolworths, 
you pay, you pick the items off, you, off the shelf and you pay for them at the checkout. You don't know how much profit Safeway or sorry, Woolworths is making in those, mm. in those items. Whereas Costco, you pay to get in the door. One fee one, annually, I think it's $60 at the moment. And Costco sell you products, all the same kinds of products, usually in bigger, bigger boxes. <laughs> um, and they sell you the products at cost price or near cost price in Costco's case. So they make 75% of their profit off the entry fee. So they all, so we go one step further and we say, we charge you an access fee to access a suite of cost price financial products that we never make profit from. We're never incentivized to sell you the product, to hide things in the disclosure statement. We're only incentivized to A, attract you to walk through the door because that's when you pay us and B, keep you there. And the only way we can keep you there is to deliver you greater value than you get off platform. Mm. So we're aligned with helping you, yeah. giving you the best product, never carving things out, never hiding things. And also we can do really interesting things with the product. So if our customers are saying, you know, like you said, will people choose the more expensive product? Mm. Maybe. And the point is if customers say to us, hey, we want a more expensive product. We can build it. We're not incentivized to say, well, no, because we make less profit because we make no profit on any of the products. Right. So talk to me about the structure of the business. So we start off being, we are, we're a limited profit company. So, um, uh, chat GPT is run by OpenAI. OpenAI is a limited profit company, for example. So, um, they raise money by selling equity in their company and they have a cap on the return. I think they are hundred X. Once their investors hit that cap, it goes, all the future profit goes to customers. They haven't really clarified how they're doing it. The way we're doing it is we're going to market as 5% customer owned. Mm -hmm. So from day one, when we launch, uh, any customer who engages with our platform will, will have a uh, an ownership share in the company. They can influence change. They can advocate for new insurance products, for example. Mm. They can advocate for all sorts of things. Um, we sell equity um, to uh, investors like every other startup to raise money. Difference being, we have a cap on the return that they are able to earn on the life of that share. And it, it changes depending on when the, the, you know, what investment round we do and the risk associated. But when our investors hit a ca their cap, they're forced to transfer their equity to the customer pool. So it starts off being 5%, but over time, it will actually end up being 95% customer owned. And we're doing that for one reason. And you say, you know, money makes the world go round. It does. And at the moment, it makes the world go round for a few people. We would like the future financial industry to be owned by many people mm. and have it have the world go round for them. And it's all about aligning interests. So 95% eventually, we reckon it'll take about 15 to 20 years to get all of our in investors out of it. And that includes us as founders. We are forced. So, so the investors would still be attracted to get in to then get out because they're getting a return, but they're also making an impact. Absolutely. So the impact is a massive element. You know, we, we are, I think it's, you know, people talk about capitalism, right? It's ugly, shitty system, blah, blah, blah. One of the things capitalism does really well is it serves the innate human need we have to advance ourselves, right? Everyone wants to advance themselves. And that's like, you know, it's about protection. It's about family. It's about security. Everyone wants a return on investment. Now we have to offer that. If we don't offer that, we're not going to raise money. Yep. And capitalism's great in many respects. Unlimited capitalism is not. So we limit it. And we say, yes, it should be fair that you get a return on this high risk venture for us to go out there and change the finance industry for humanity, mm -hmm. but it needs to be for humanity. And yeah. so the net, the net benefit has to be for our customers. Well, I can base. see how, I, I can see how this platform would lead to a more engaged consumer who's then gonna go, well, right, now that I trust and I've got what I need, I need something for my will. I need something for my life insurance. Absolutely, I think trust is a really interesting, uh, I guess, topic in the financial services industry because it's an entire industry. We were talking off camera about mortgage brokers and they get really upset when I talk about them because mortgage brokers say they're all about the customer. They're all about helping you get a loan. Well, it, fe it feels like when you when you go for a loan or you go to your, uh, your, your accountant guy, and you go to your mortgage broker guy because he knows you and you've got that trust and you feel like he's got your best, he or she's got your best interest. Absolutely. And the issue is he's being paid, he or she, or, or they are being paid by someone that's not you. They're being paid by the, either the manufacturer of the product, they're being paid by the, um, the issuer of the product. And for people who know how this stuff works behind the scenes, there are certain loans you're never going to get approved for. And the broker knows that. So he's only going to put you in front of the loan that he thinks you're going to get. That might be, have a higher interest rate. 
Mm. Now, you know, people make the argument, well, you know, your interest is getting the loan. Well, yeah, sure. But what if you can't afford it? What if he, what if he's putting you in a position that you shouldn't be in? And, yeah. you know, I think trust is an interesting one because the interests of the industry don't allow for trust at the moment. You know, people want a safe place to, to navigate money. There is no safe place. Everyone goes to comparison sites. It is one of the most unsafe places to navigate money. You only see some products. They're, pay, they're, they're paying a huge amount to appear on the screen and they're hiding all the details of why they're cheaper in this document. And so trust is this, it, it doesn't exist. And the only way we put trust back into financial services is if we change how we get paid. If we get paid from the product, you cannot trust us. You cannot. And any company that says you trust us and gets paid when you choose a product is lying. So first and foremost, we change that. But secondly, we should never have to say you trust us. You should see it. Yep. The moment I put my hand up and say, hey, you can trust us. We've got a problem because any person that says you can trust us, it's a faith based ask. You know, it's like I have to have faith in that person. Well, what if we build a system that is just, well, there's the trust because it's we're in the interests are aligned with you. The benefits are for you. You get to vote, you know, 15, 20 years from now, Maslow will be 95% owned by our customers. And I want that to be humanity. It might change eventually. And our customers will influence that change. It might be that every single person on earth is entitled to one share of Maslow. That's it. They get to vote. They get to define how it grows. Each country can be run however it wants to be run. We don't know, but it's exciting because by, by changing how Maslow operates, we change what we can do with this industry. We can make it from this thing that extracts from us all to make a few people pretty wealthy to this large system that serves all of us. And it's quite ironic because it serves all of our selfish needs. I mean, it just serves more of us and equally. So who would be most scared of Maslow and who would be most excited about Maslow and not from necessarily a consumer point of view, but from a competitive or complementary business because I can think of all the people that would want this to go away which is usually a good flag to say hey it needs to be done but I'm trying to think of who are the people that would be really incentivized to want to help bring this to life yeah so we get a lot of support for from the philanthropic space mm -hmm. the impact investment space but more than anything else people who are committed to truth we have an issue with truth at the moment right and you know it's, this lack of truth is threatening democracy well Coming back to this system that we're in introducing truth into and, and, and honesty, it's this really exciting opportunity to have this honest conversation around, well, hey, if we serve everyone's interests and it's there, then we can do some really exciting things. So we get interest from people who have been um, alienated from the industry as it is at the moment, which is 90% of the population, let's be real. Um, and we get a lot of support from uh Academics love us, especially economic e e economists. Mm -hmm. So a couple of professors are really supporting us. Um, I'm speaking to the chance chancellor of a university at the moment about support. Uh, the head of the Ethics Alliance in Australia is a massive supporter of ours because what we do actually has a net benefit for so many people. We're limiting our own, you know, we've I've put a cap on our founder share, shares, for example. So I, at some point, I just randomly get forced out of the company and that's so I should. I shouldn't put my hand up and build this new thing that serves, you know, hopefully billions of people and then somehow end up in control of it at the end. That's not right. I love it. Love um, it. But in terms of who, who, we, who, who don't want to see this succeed, anyone within the industry that earns money from the decision that you make. So when you, when they say, Hey, you should buy our product and you go, yeah, I will buy your product. If they get paid from your, that, from that transaction, they're not going to like us because we, uh, we make that model obsolete and we make the products far cheaper. Um, and over time, as we get more customers, our products get cheaper and cheaper. Um, we speak to a lot of people, insurance actuaries love us. They get really excited because they're numbers people and they, they look at us and they say, hang on a minute, if you do this really well, we could like, we could drop the price of insurance by 50%. We go, yep. And then they start doing all the figures and they go, oh, but this is amazing. If you only ever have to reconcile the insurance product back to zero every year, it doesn't have to make profit for investors, but it just serves the customers. Wow, that changes insurance. That changes the entire industry. Mm. And we can do that across um, all of the sub industries in, in varying stages and, 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 you know, to varying degrees as well. Mate, that's awesome. Uh, I know Ben's behind the camera, but I just want to ask him if there's something that's popped up during the interview, because I'm sure there is at least one thing that he'd love to ask you or that's, you know, sticking with him 
Yeah, so we'll have tiers based on how many products you've got. Um, we'll start our, our gateway product uh, is banking. So we are going to launch a banking product through a partnership, um, much the same way UpBank did with Bendigo Bank. Um, I can't say who with, but it's a, with an aligned um, a banking partner. So for bank, bank accounts, you might not pay much, if, if anything at all, or you might pay $3 a month, let's say. But it's really to get you into the ecosystem to see what we offer you and how, get you into interacting with the community. From there, you've got things like insurance, which for our, our primary market to start with is really important, car insurance, renter's insurance, whatever it might be. Uh, and we say, yep, if you take one insurance product, you have to go to the next tier of membership. But we, we, we're working on the basis of $10 a month to have about three, what we call value add products. So you might have your, your banking, bank account, your insurance, and maybe an investment product, and you might pay $10 a month. But you can be rest assured uh, in that we will only ever charge you um, an amount that is a magnitude le uh, less than the money um, you, you would have spent elsewhere. So um, we're at a te we're 10x. So if we can save you $10, $100, we'd want to we'd want to charge you $10. So that's sort of the 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 way we go about it. Could you help people bring down their rates? I just got my rates bill, and I'm like, oh my god! Can't help with uh, local government. I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, no, I'm just my, my, I'm racking through in my head all of the, the big lumpy things that are attached to life every single year. And it's like, oh, wow, well, maybe a way to save on your rates and your bills is the savings you're going to make on all these other financial products. One of the things we hear a lot about, you know, in the tech space or the startup space is um, a super app. Elon Musk talks about a super app. China's got WeChat. Um, and everyone who... That's a bit scary, but everyone who wants control wants to create a super app. Yeah. And a super app, if it's run by one dude who's in charge and gets all the benefit, it's probably going to be a certain thing. But a super app is this really nice idea of being able to go to one place and, you know, sort of sort your life out. All the logistics that, of your does life. Does China already have that with WeChat? Oh, look, they, they do lots of things within WeChat that um, they do because they force involvement with it, you know, and that's another conversation. But one of the... Um, one of the criticisms of a super app is that is the business model. Where does it get remunerated? How do you pay for it? Whose interests is it or are, are it serving? And, and if you have a look at, you know, if Elon Musk builds a super app and he wants to do it with Twitter or whatever you want to call it and bring payments in so I can send money to you and then that will expand into financial products and Apple's tried to do it with financial products. The issue is the moment you, you know, if you don't change how you get remunerated for those, for those financial products, you, the incentives of that super app are misaligned with the customers, right? So if we succeed in this model that is customer centric, right? We, we only make money if our customers get better outcomes. Like there's no other way for us to make money. Um, and we distribute that money to customers and over time customers get 95% of that, right? Mm -hmm. And 5% gets held in a, um, in a trust or a, 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 by a foundation that always ensures that we pursue profit because we need to be profitable. It's the only way we'll be viable. But 95% of that profit will go to the customers. Yep. And they'll decide how they how that goes to the customers. It could be a payment, it could be cheaper products, and that's up to them. And we don't know how that'll go, which is kind of exciting. But um, we have the opportunity to create a, a super app that has the aligned interest with the customer. And that's pretty special. So sitting here, hearing it, and listening to that other episode, and like, I, I want to help, I want to get involved. <laughs> We get like, that a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so how do you funnel that? And, and for people watching and listening in our small little world, um, if someone does see this and wants to know how they can get involved with you right now at the phase you're at, what's the best thing they can do and how can they get involved? Yeah. So for now, uh, we're building our, our database of people who want to get behind this, want to own a share in this, in this, hopefully this new financial industry. Uh, so they can sign up at our, at our website, maslow.com.au. Uh, and that's, those are the people for whom we will first build products. So once we put together the app, we'll go to them and say, Hey, here's the platform, here's access. What do you need? What, what do you need out of an insurance product? And they will help us build those products. Um, we'll work with our banking partner who is able to also help us with insurance and we'll say, okay, what do you need? And let's build the products for these people. So we want to have 20,000 people on that database by that mid next year, which is when we'll start going to market with some products. And so if you want to get involved, that's where to go to. Love it, mate. Kane, it's awesome to hear where you're up to and what you're trying to do, man. Thanks, mate. And good on you for doing it. Well, someone's got to. I don't know if it has to be me, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs>
and it's 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 not always going to be easy i'm sure and i'm sure you've already had some ups and downs but um what would you say is the one thing especially for a founder listening as they approach probably going to go through some ups and downs what's getting you through what do you think is the different thing that's stealing you for when you do face those shitty times um i'm still doing the same thing i started doing with back in high school when i first i first did um, community work was soup man. I was lucky enough to be dragged along kicking and screaming because I was a pretty rebellious kid because I hated where I was. Um, and I, I, my first experience with community work was soup man with St. Vincent de Paul. And that's where my obsession with writing unfairnesses or unfairness started. And I think I'm, I, I hate injustice. I, I seriously, I get goosebumps. Um, yeah. And that drives me. It's the only thing that drives me. I would definitely say to people who get into you know, a, a company with any form of social good that you can't be doing it for the money because it's hard. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not loaded. I have no money. I've spent everything I've ever earned to get where I am. And, you know, in that process, you learn so much about yourself and it's hard and it's, you know, people will, yeah, throw things at you along the way. And a lot of people don't want us to succeed. We've experienced that directly. And we've had a lot of people warn us about how many more people will sort of come at us. And, you know, we're ready for that and positioning for that was hard. But yeah, look, starting a, a as you know, starting a, an early stage venture is borderline nuts. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with what I want our impact to be on the world. I want, our, our world needs change, it's that simple. Yep. Um, and I'm not necessarily the right person, but no one else was doing it the way I, I saw change needed. And I know I'm definitely not the right person to sort of see it mature in the end. I don't think any one person is, but you know, at the moment where we're going to, we're going to give it a go, get it heading in the right direction and see what it can do. Mate, follow this guy on LinkedIn. <laughs> you'll, you'll be entertained from like the moment you stumble across his profile. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks mate. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks gang.